Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond. And over the past 16 months, we built this beautiful five acre pond. And I kept the camera rolling 24 hours a day from the beginning of the build because I wanted to document the process and also share it with any of you future pond builders. Because I spent about a year on research and engineering before we built the pond. And ponds are just one of those topics that there's not a ton of information out there on. So I thought this would be a perfect time to recap all of the good and bad that happened throughout this journey. Because anytime you take on a project this size, there's always going to be things that don't go the way you expected. And we had our fair share of those, but overall I'd say the pond turned out great. But today we're going to start out with the bad. Basically anything that was unexpected or that we didn't plan during this whole process. So the first thing I will say, if you're looking into building a pond in the future, the first thing you need to do, and probably the most obvious, is look at location. And really there's two main things you need to look at. You need to make sure you have enough watershed to sustain the water levels in the pond. And the next and most important factor is you need to make sure you have the right type of soil, in most cases it's clay, to hold the water. And we knew that from the very beginning of the project, one of our biggest obstacles in this pond build was going to be due to its location. We did soil samples early on and we had a sandy clay that wasn't going to hold water. And one easy way to check for yourself is you can take a little ball of clay in your hand and roll it up and if it sticks together there's a good chance it'll hold water but if it breaks apart it's definitely not going to work. So after talking with geotech engineers and our pond designer we knew that to build a five acre pond in this location we were going to need 850 dump truck loads of clay. And it's hard to picture the volume of 850 trucks until you actually see it yourself. But we basically hauled in clay all day every day and it took us a full month to get it delivered to our site. And we used all of the clay to build the dam and to line the entire pond with a two foot clay blanket. So problem number one came with just the logistics of moving that much volume from point A to point B. So the first thing I had to do was build roads that would support those heavy trucks coming in and out of the property. And after we got the roads built, the next obstacle was battling the weather. So every time we got rain, we basically had to use all of the pond building equipment to get the big trucks unstuck. So there was a lot of unexpected time just transporting the clay in. And any time we got any significant amount of rain, it would shut down the hauling completely. And keep in mind, whenever you're building a pond, sometimes the pond contractors rent this equipment. So each day or week the project gets delayed, it adds to the overall expense. But I will say our guys over at American Sports Fish did a great job with this. And hiring the right people to build your pond is definitely the most important decision you'll make. So the logistics of getting that volume of clay to the pond site was our first problem. And the second problem came during spreading the clay. So the next step was to spread all of the clay out. And it's very, very important that you get it compacted. So you take a machine like this with a big roller on the front and continue to drive over it until you get the clay compacted to a certain percent. And some of the information I learned from the geotechs is something I wish I knew before building the pond. So clay can be complex in itself, and it's because it's got a range of water or moisture trapped inside of it at all times. And if the clay is too dry, it'll crack and become unspreadable. And if it's too wet, it'll become too soft. And when you try to compact it, it basically spreads like mud. And if you look here in this clip, you can see it's like waves of water rolling out from under it as he tries to pack it in. So luckily, probably 80 to 90% of all the clay that was brought in had the perfect moisture content. But unfortunately, we did have some of that really wet clay come in at different stages of the build that led to future problems. So when you build a pond dam, you start out digging a trench and compacting it full of clay and building your pond dam up around it until you get to your desired height. And unfortunately, we put a couple of loads of that wet clay in one area of the pond dam and hindsight, this is one of those things I wish I knew more about it back then because months later after the pond was completely built and all the equipment was gone, that wet clay finally settled in and created a low spot on one area of the dam. And thankfully we caught it in time because this could have really led to some bad outcomes. So anytime you build a pond dam, you want it to be three feet taller than your drain pipe. And the idea is that whenever you get a heavy rain, any excess water will go down the drain and never rise quickly enough that it goes over the levee of the pond dam. Because usually when this happens, everything starts washing out. And just like that, all your fish and hard work can be gone in an instant. So luckily we caught it in time. We brought some extra clay in there and then reseeded it. And that's something we're going to have to continue to watch and make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. 
So it's time for today's cookout, and if you live in a remote location like me, you should check out ButcherBox. They provide high-quality meats and seafood to your doorstep every month, and they've got a really good deal going on right now, and that's every new member that signs up will receive a bone-in, 30-ounce tomahawk steak for free in their first box. That's one heck of a deal, folks. And man, that is one good-looking steak. I'm going to show you my favorite way to cook it, and I'm basically just going to add a little bit of olive oil and some salt, but one thing I would highly recommend is adding some minced garlic. And I like to apply it really heavy because most of the garlic will fall off during the cooking process. And a perfectly cooked steak doesn't need any extra toppings. But guys, if you're trying to impress the ladies for the holidays, heat up some lump crab meat mixed in with a little bit of charbroiled butter. And that makes for a perfect pairing with this 30 ounce tomahawk steak. So folks, I would highly recommend Butcher Box. They make it easy by delivering meats like this directly to your doorstep. And there's no better time to sign up than with this 30 ounce tomahawk steak promotion. And if you're interested, I'll put a link down in the video description. So do me a favor, folks, and go check them out. So most of the obstacles in the beginning were all due to clay. And for any of you pond builders that are thinking about going this route in the future, I've discovered a couple more things that it affects. Again, things that I wish I knew or would have thought of. And the first thing is because you have a clay liner, you obviously never want anything puncturing a hole through it, so you can basically give up on planting trees anywhere near the pond. Now, in the beginning, we even wanted to plant cypress trees in the pond, but quickly had to cancel that idea. And something else that I didn't think about that hurts as a bass fisherman, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to feed the bass in our pond crawfish, because crawfish during the winter months will burrow a hole in the clay blanket, which would also just create holes throughout the pond, so that's another one of those things I have to sacrifice by using a clay liner. So now let's move on to the next problem and one that every pond owner fears, and that's a leak. So as soon as we started filling our pond up with water, we quickly realized there must be a leak because I put a measuring stick on the pond overflow pipe and it was dropping too fast so we knew we had a leak. And luckily we had one dry day when I was flying the drone over the pond and I saw the wet spots on the back side of the pond dam and was able to pinpoint where the leak was. And I'm not gonna lie, when I first found out we had a leak in pond, I lost some sleep over it, but this one actually turned out to be one of the easiest fixes out of all of our problems. So there's a product called Soil Flock that makes a two-part polymer that you just add while your pond is full, and as those two different polymers come in contact with each other in water, they expand up to 30 times their original size. So we focused on the leaking areas in the pond, and then as that water was leaking through the pond dam, the polymers expanded and basically sealed the leak off. And folks, I will say I'm a 100% believer in this because I saw it with my own two eyes. It completely fixed our leak, and that was a huge relief because the last thing you want to do is spend all this time and effort building a beautiful pond, and then if it leaked and couldn't hold water, I would have been devastated. So now let's talk about one of the next hurdles we had to overcome, and that is erosion. So this is one of those things I knew could happen. I did everything in my power to plan for it, prevent it, but it still happened. There's something powerful about fast moving water that simply just does damage. So unfortunately our pond finished up right during hurricane season and before all the grasses and everything could get established, we had several heavy rainfalls. And we would go through and add hay waddles and silt fences. And I also planted multiple types of grass. I'd plant brown top millet because it's fast growing and develops quick, and then we also put Bermuda and Bahia grass down, and they're great because they have really deep roots and can handle extreme drought, but the one thing I've since learned is how slow they grow. So we just had two main parts of the pond where all the water flowed in, and each time we got a really heavy rain, it created a lot of damage, and we even tried adding some liners and rocks, and that did help. And I'll also say there are a couple of options I didn't use, one of them would have been adding those big rocks along the banks where the water flooded in. But unfortunately, one of those spots was one of the areas where we're adding the waterfall. So I didn't want to haul all that rock in and just have to move it later. But just keep in mind, if you build a pond, you're probably going to have some erosion. And one of the best things I did discover was hydro seeding. And this basically saved our dam because we were starting to see a little erosion on the dam. But I got some guys to come through and smooth that out, and they spray these multiple different types of seeds in this tacked material, and it sticks to the bank and holds everything there in place. It also traps moisture and creates a perfect environment to get those grasses and seeds growing quick. So hindsight, I would have done the hydro seeding a little bit earlier. 
And I don't want this video to be all about the bad, so I am going to sprinkle in a few success stories. And one of them was just filling the pond with water. So to fill our pond up, we installed a well with a 5 horsepower pump and a 2 inch line, and that produced about 100 gallons per minute. And we did the math on it, and to fill up a 5 acre pond that averages 6 feet in depth and is 12 foot at the deepest part, it was going to take somewhere in the ballpark 55 to 60 days. Fortunately, we did have one hurricane come through, so it shortened that up a little bit. But the well was one of those success stories that worked without any problems, and we'll always have that available in the future if we have any droughts. We can always add water to it. But we also had something else interesting that happened once we filled the pond, and when all that water reacted with the clay, it created this really green tint to the pond. <laughs> and that was probably one of the most asked questions, why is the pond so green? But another one of the success stories is liming and fertilizing a pond. And when you lime a pond, it basically corrects those water parameters and gets your pH and acidic levels back into the right range. So when you fertilize a pond, you'll create those fertile blooms that'll benefit all the fish in the pond and also allow it to have a higher fish capacity. And another one of those that I feel like is a small success story, but I'm gonna keep an eye on it, is the underwater green lights that I added to the pond. So you don't see too many bass ponds that have underwater lights, but my theory is that it allows the fish to feed for an extended part of the day, or basically 24 hours a day. Because at night, the lights attract all the bait fish in, and that makes it easy for the bass to come in and eat at night. And it's still a little early to tell, but I feel like the bass in this pond are growing at an above average pace because they can eat all day and night. But I have started tagging the bass with the RFID chips, so we will be able to track their growth, and we'll know for certain in the upcoming months what those growth rates are. But time will also tell if there's any negatives associated with the lights, because it could just make the bass lazy during the daytime if they can eat so easily at night. So I'll have to keep you guys updated on that one. So I could talk about stuff like this for days, so if you're interested in more of this informative style video, leave a comment down below on any type of pond topic, and I'll be happy to share the things I learned or in this case, mistakes that we made, because we really hadn't even scratched the surface. There are dozens of other things I could talk about, including cost, stocking the fish, things that are done behind the scenes, like the engineering and working with the geotechs, and things of that nature. So I'll be happy to elaborate on any topics you guys want. Just let me know what you're interested in. So now it's time to check in on the pet bass, and we wanted to see if the smallest one we called Tiger was in the Christmas spirit. <laughs> and he said, not in my house. So now let's watch a couple feeding clips. Now you guys have seen a lot of these bluegill feeding clips in the past where the aggressive piranhas come up and eat the pellets off the surface, but look who started stopping by during each feeding. We've got a juvenile bald eagle that has made the pond his home, and I got mixed feelings about him. I love seeing eagles around the pond, but I know he's going to put a dent in the fish population, but oh well, that's just nature. All right, it's time for another fish tagging session. We got the pit tag scanner here. We're going to measure their length, and if it's over a pound or if I think it's close, I'm going to go ahead and weigh it because that would be one of the first contest winners. But we're just going to be out here trying some little small lizards today. Let's go see what'll bite. Here's one. Got him. What we got here? You're running straight at the dot. Oh yeah. Nice one. All right, 11 and a half inches. This one is 0971. I'm getting closer to a pound. All right, here we go. Got him. Out there off a little deep drop off. Biggest one of the day. We're getting closer to a pound. 
12, almost 12 and a half inches. That's a nice one. Look at that big belly. Scan her to make sure she hasn't been caught. All right, this one is 148. All right, we're gonna weigh her real quick before we let her go. She is three quarters of a pound. But that's a nice female. Go ahead and get her back. She's headed back out there deep. The hook throne seems to be the hot spot. All right, 11 inches long. This little guy is 0913. Got a little belly on him. And let's explain the contest real quick. So we're gonna tag the first 100 bass we catch in the pond, and I'm letting you all name them, and if I select your name, your YouTube channel gets added to this list, and then you can see the pit tag will be right here beside it. And each time we catch them, we're gonna track their length, weight, and girth, but we're still taking fish name suggestions. And so if you see an empty letter on this spreadsheet, leave a comment down below with a fish name. And the reason you wanna get on the list is because we got some cool prizes and giveaways so let's take a look at some of those challenges. So the first categories are tracking the fastest growing bass in the pond. So the first winners are gonna be the fish that reach the one, two, three, and four pound marks. And whoever's bass reaches five pounds first will actually get a trip to come out here and catch some themselves. And as this contest goes along, we're gonna keep adding different categories as a way of showing our thanks to all of you that have followed the entire pond build series. And we also just added one new category of the first bluegill to reach a pound and so I'm gonna tag five bluegills and their names are gonna start with A, B, M, S, and T. So all you have to do to enter the contest is leave a fish name down in the comments below. And now it's time to feed Mr. Moby. I want to take a quick second to wish everyone happy holidays and we're excited about the things we got coming up this next year. Just a couple of days ago, I was on the phone with Greg the Pond Guy planning our next pond build and waterfall feature for 2023. So you definitely don't want to miss that one, folks. So make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with this five acre pond build and all the exciting things we have coming in the future. But I hope you all enjoyed this video and we will see you all next time.